Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Uh, today we're going to talk about the parable of the sower. And in Jesus' day, it was a little bit different farming than it is today. It wasn't mechanized. But what, what they would do is that uh, they would have pathways along everybody's pieces of property. Much when I grew up in Michigan, you would have your own pieces of property. You'd have your, your, your secondary roads, and you'd have your roads that would go back out into your fields as well. So in, in those days, people would travel by your property to get to the main roads to get back to the market. So our culture is similar in many ways because somehow you have to get to the main place, the city, the village, wherever you're going to, to trade. And, and so this is how it worked in Jesus' day. So today I want to talk to you about four different kinds of hearts. The first heart is the indifferent heart, and, and it's the pathway. And so I have a picture here today of my sidewalk. It's kind of hard to, to grow anything in my sidewalk, but you can see a little piece of grass is trying to grow in the crack. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed along the pathway. You will notice in this section that the people with this kind of heart do not understand the word of God. The gospel is nonsense to them. They have no room for God in their heart. These are the kind of people that make fun of a person who is a believer in Jesus. They make fun of faith. They make fun of people at work or wherever they can because this makes nonsense to them and this is just kind of hocus pocus bogus to them. Jesus said this about this group in Matthew 13, 14. Though seeing, they do not see, and though hearing, they do not understand. The seed is good, but the ground is hard. The second kind of heart is the impulsive heart, the rocky heart. And I took this right out here in our driveway, this, you know, this piece between here and the school. That is be pretty hard to grow anything in. That is very, very hard. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So the method of planting in Jesus' day was called broadcasting. You, you take from your sack and you throw it out. And of course the wind that sometimes will catch it and it will go onto the pathway. And, and right by the pathway is, is the part that really doesn't get plowed. So that's where your thorns and thistles will grow. Even though it's good enough ground to grow stuff, yet it's pretty hard to plow it because of the pathway. So in, in Jesus' day when we begin to look at all this, it was not uncommon in that part of the world to have what we would call like a shale bed and then some dirt over the top so they would have this kind of rock bed and maybe a thin layer of soil where the, the roots could actually begin to sprout be, but they couldn't go down because of the rock under it so when the sun came out and scorched it the, the plants would die. So you would note too here it, it doesn't say that these people did not understand the Word of God but they received it with joy but when trouble and hardship came, it was a problem for them. The person initially is on fire for God, great, great joy, but because of trouble, they blame God. You know, it's not my fault, God. I mean, I've done everything for you, and this is what I get as the results. Uh, these kind of people sometimes are the perpetual victims in life. And maybe we felt like that from time to time as well. How can I endure being a Christian in my family because my fellow family members pick on me, make fun of me because of my faith? Or how about at work? When my boss is antagonistic towards Christianity, makes fun of people who believe, how do I survive at work and remain true to God, my Heavenly Father? When persecution comes from the pathway, these people quickly fall away, even though they're, at the beginning they're filled with great enthusiasm. So the question today is my faith on bedrock with just a thin layer of soil. Then we have the impure heart. And here, here, I found a, a, a few uh, weeds uh, out here by our field out and back. It wasn't hard to find them at all. They're growing very, very well. 
The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deception of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Once again, these people understand, and the seed will grow. Just as the seed would grow on the shallow dirt, the seed of the word of God will grow in people's hearts. But unfortunately, we live in a very materialistic world. We have all worries. Will there be enough to retire? How about my health? Will it continue during my retirement age? How about my boss? He doesn't quite understand me at work. If you're a student, my teacher just doesn't get it, how I think and how I do my homework. Or how about in the family? A child says, will my mother and father accept me for who I am? You see, we worry about a list of issues, health, wealth, relationships, popularity, and being accepted. So as you look at the soil of your heart this day, what I see is that this person right here is more focused on self. How do I make sure I have enough wealth? How do I make sure I got enough for retirement? How do I make sure that this is for me, this is for me, this is for me? Versus focusing on Jesus. How can I take the word of God and spread it out to other people? So when we begin to look at our lives, sometimes they're infested with thorns and thistles, which then gets me to the impregnated heart, the good soil. So here I've got a lawn that's our lawn, and you can see that it's still got a little bit of work to do in certain patches. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So good ground bears good fruit. So the question is today is, how is your ground? How is your soil? Now what I recognize is that I fall into this category and the thorns and thistles at times. The worries of life. You know, is there enough money to retire? How about our health? How about our family structure? How about the church structure? How's the church doing? I mean, you can talk about all the worries of life. And when I begin to see this, I have to say, Lord, I begin to see the thorns and the thistles in my life. Thank you for pointing them out to me. Help me to be focused on Jesus and Jesus alone. Because I know, God, that you have taken care of me in the past. And I know, Lord, that you will take care of me in the future. Why should I worry? Because I'm human. That's the problem. I worry because many times I don't trust God implicitly with all that I have. But God is still at work in our lives each and every day. How about you? Where is your heart today? God expects growth in your life, and God expects growth in my life, and God expects us to be broadcasting the seed of the gospel. So what, what rate are you reproducing? 160, 30-fold. So the question I ask you today is, what is Jesus up to in your life? And I got this question from a book that we have been reading. So I thought about this question, and I thought about what is Jesus up to in the life of our congregation? Now, some of you remember June the 29th, we had a voters meeting, and we reaffirmed our mission of the school. Now, with that comes accountability, is that we have to be accountable to the voters meeting in September to bring a plan to say, this is how we will support the ministry of the school. This is how the school will be much more financially sustainable. And then we work the plan. The voters holds the board of directors accountable, and the board of directors holds the senior pastor accountable, and I hold the ministry team accountable, that we will be successful because we will have benchmarks along the way. Eight of us went on a mission trip to Honduras. It was a great time, and it was a, a great experience. And, and we're going to be sharing that just in a moment when Katie Curtis comes up for the children's message, and Keith Massey will be here also to share during the offering time. 
is that what God has been doing in our lives. I presented to the board of directors last Tuesday a concept about Lutheran Student Center. I believe as we put the energy into our school as a congregation, I also believe that we have an opportunity to put the same kind of energy into the Lutheran Student Center. And so I have invited the pastors around our area. I have used our vice president in the area to really get the attention of the pastors around the area. Paul Krenz, our minister of, of missions as well, and that in the first week in August, we're gonna have a meeting here at Grace Lutheran to speak about Lutheran Student Center and how we can possibly call a missionary to Lutheran Student Center, a full-time person who is a trained DCE or DCO. DCE is the Director of Christian Education, DCO, Director of Christian Outreach. And we would partner together with the other congregations and individuals around our area. Now some of you may be thinking this is a pipe dream. I don't think so. Let me share this story with you maybe as a way to solidify this concept. Don Richardson wrote in his book Eternity in Their Hearts, he tells this amazing spiritual story about the Lehu people Many of us know that the country Burma today is Miramir, Miramar, and this lies over by China and Laos. And what happens is that there is a people called the Lehu. And for centuries, they believed in a god that they called Guxie. And they had in their, and, and in their writings and in their belief, is that God wrote the commandments on rice cakes. And one time there was a severe famine and all the elders ate the rice cakes. And so no longer did they have the written word of God. But the elders said now the written word of God is within us. But that wasn't good enough because in their writings and in their reasonings they had prophets who, who talked about that God would send a white person with white pages in a book that would have God's commandments. And for centuries, the prophets proclaimed that this would happen. And they taught their people with Proverbs, and this is one of the Proverbs. If a man had 10 armloads of walking sticks and walked until every walking stick was worn to a stub, he would still not find Gushi. But when the right time comes, Gushi will send to us a white brother with a white book containing his laws. The word lost by our forefathers so long ago, that white brother will bring the lost book to our very homes. Well, in the 1890s, a young missionary by the name of William Marfus Young was appointed to preach the gospel to the Shan people. And the Shan people lived on the plains, and the Lehu people lived in the mountains, same part of the country. And one day, Missionary Young is proclaiming the gospel, and he's basically talking about the law of God. And, and the Shan people are Buddhists, so they're, they're kind of in the marketplace, kind of milling around. But the Lehu people who had come into market, they're dressed differently. And all of a sudden, this young missionary has their attention. As he holds up the book and they see the glistening white pages, they are reminded of the prophecy of the prophets. That, ye, that, that Suche would send a white man with a white book to proclaim God's law. So after he was done preaching, all these men gathered around him and said, we beg you, come to our villages. As, as it says, we have been waiting for you for centuries. We have been meeting in houses. We have houses built in some of our villages in readiness for your coming. And the people wore wristbands in those days made of cords. And these wristbands symbolized is that they were in slavery to the evil spirits. And only that white man could come and cut them free from their bondage. So they said to him, you alone as the messenger of God may cut these manacles from our wrists. But only after you have brought the book of the true God to our very homes. Missionary Young baptized 2,200 people in 1904. 
And from 1904 to 1936, he baptized over 2,000 people until he died. Would you say that was a hundredfold missionary? I would. I believe at Lutheran Student Center, we have all these foreign students. I believe they may be our Lehu people. That's a good possibility. I will bring that up to the other pastors around us as we gather together to really say that the field is white for harvest. We are missionaries. Who are the Lehu people in your life? Is it your family, where you work, where you live? See, God calls us for one thing, is to broadcast the gospel. The seed is good. Sometimes the ground is hard. Sometimes the ground has soil, but rock under it. Sometimes it's thorns and thistles. But sometimes the soil is great. And other people will increase the sharing of the gospel because of what we have done. We are missionaries right here to bring the hope of Christ to our community. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank you.